churches, and, and we're just so glad you've joined us tonight. I hope you had something to eat. If you didn't have anything to eat in there, it's your own fault. I don't know what to tell you. But after the presentation, you have a couple of choices. One is, uh, Andy has a number of materials that uh, I hope you'll take a look at, uh, some wonderful materials that uh, I've used in my devotional life, and we're using on Wednesday night in our journey to the cross. Um, so there, that's, that's available to you. Um, and like I said, there's still a lot of food over there in the gym. So you can make your way over there, and uh, we won't tell anybody. So uh, we are, we're glad you're here. Now, we took an offering this morning. We're going to take one tonight. Now, if you gave this morning, thank you. And if you want to give tonight, there'll be somebody at the doors, and you can just make your gift there. But already you've been very, very generous, and we, we're very, very thankful for that. I just want to mention a couple things to those who are brand new to us tonight. Um, Andy Cook is our presenter. Andy uh, has served in churches as a pastor 27 years. Uh, he started going to Israel in the, about 1999 and then started taking groups to Israel. And over a course of a number of years, about 600 people joined him on those tours. But since that time, he's been doing something that nobody else is doing. He's doing these kinds of presentations in churches all over. And I got to, my wife and I got to see him in Birmingham, and, it, and it's, it stirred us so much that I wanted our folks here to get the chance to, uh, to see him, hear him, and learn from him. And we learned this morning, didn't we? It was a, a great service. Um, so you're a part of a growing number of people. In the last uh, six and a half years, some 67,000 people have done what we're doing, and that is we have allowed uh, Andy to bring Israel to us. So we're awfully glad you're here tonight. I know you're going to get a lot from this, and uh, we're just we're, we're glad we could learn together. So uh, let me pray for you, and then, then uh, Pat's going to come and lead us in some music, and then Andy will come and, and uh, make this great presentation for us. Let's pray. Gracious God, we, we thank you for the truth of your word. We need it today more than ever. And now as this word becomes alive in, in the opportunities that we have tonight to learn and to listen, we just ask that you bless our hearts, not just for our enjoyment, but for the opportunities we'll have to share the good news with others. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, can we stand and sing a couple of these great choruses? Here, I'll help you. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. We're going to bless his holy name tonight. Sing it, would you? Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Sing that again. Bless. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy done great things. He has done great things. That's good. He has done great things. He has done great things. Bless his holy name. Be Got it. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just because he lives. You sound good one more time. Because he lives, I can face, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, fear is gone. All fear is gone. Because I know he holds the fear. Just 
Amen. You may be seated. Can't hold everything. I'm with you. Well, thank you for coming, coming back. I'm always impressed if somebody comes back. Uh, and and I, I have so enjoyed my day here. I feel uh, you've made me feel right at home, and uh, I've enjoyed the hospitality. Wanted to share with you about our resources. First of all, if you go to this website and do the backslash Williams, you can download what amounts to a free book. And it's what we give our travelers when they go to Israel to help them see. It's got charts. It's got uh, drawings of what some of the ruins look like. It's really, really a cool resource. And, a, and it's a PDF file. You can download it. This is uh, The Search for God's Own Heart. It's the story of David's life. Uh, first book I wrote. It actually is our best-selling book. And we, uh, I brought a few copies of that. And maybe we can come back one day and I can do my David and Goliath presentation. Uh, but in case you're interested, this, uh, this is How Imperfect People Can Find the Most Treasured Title of All. How did David, who committed murder, adultery, lied to people, uh, how did he become a man after God's own heart? You know, that's, that's interesting. But I tell you what, if David can do it, um, then there's hope for me, you know? Now, uh, this is uh, secrets from the ancient path and more secrets from the ancient path. So like this morning's message... Uh, was one of, of these. Now, I, I started writing, well, I was a journalist before I went in, in, into ministry, before God called us to ministry. So I've, I've been a writer for years and years and years and love to write. And when I first started being published, our, our publisher was up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and, and he, they, they took me down to, I almost said they wined and dined me in Orlando, but that would not be right. So, <laughs> now there was no wine, but we were dining, and he said, I, um, and, and it was a it was a big meeting of book bookstore owners and all. I was really impressed, and at the time hoping to become the next Max Lucado. That didn't work out, but nevertheless, <laughs> he said, "I wanted to I want to give you some advice on selling books." And I'm like, "Well, I want some advice on selling books. You're the publisher." And he said, um, first of all, if you'll write for people who are hurting, you'll never run out of an audience." I thought that was good. If you'll write for people who are hurting. In fact, if you'll preach for people who are hurting, you'll never run out of an audience. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. And then I, I, I didn't even have to write that down. I said, well, what's the second one? He said, well, the second thing I wanted to tell you to do is you need to write for women. And I mean, he seriously said that. And, I'm, I'm like, and it kind of rattled me. And I said, write for women? He said, yep. I said, why would I want to write for women? He said, because women buy books. And I said, well, I buy a lot of books. He said, he was just eating away. He said, he said, you're the exception. Trust me, you need to write for women. I said, what if I want to write for men? He said, well, in that case, you want to put pictures in your book? Yes. So we have lots of pictures in our book. And uh, the book Pastor Mark keeps talking about, it's called Secrets from Via Della Rosa. It also has pictures. I love the pictures in here. More than that, I just love the message, and it's a great read before Easter. Uh, this book came out uh, just in time for Easter of 2020, which happened to be the only Easter in church history when we didn't have church. So, uh, But we have plenty of those books. If we happen to run out of our supply, you can, uh, you can contact me at experienceisraelnow.com. Tell me you saw me here at this church, and I'll pay for the ship, and you just, we'll work it out, okay? Just, just call me. Uh, let's see, more resources. We have something called the photo of the day. This is free. If you go to our website, you can sign up online in like five seconds. If you want to take longer than that, write your name down clearly, first and last name, and especially your email address. Make sure I can read it uh, and just drop it back at the table. And by the way, we have, did I have a bookmark in that? We have free bookmarks back there. It, it doesn't matter. There's some free bookmarks just drop by our book table. Our photo of the day goes out five days a week. Just think about it, 250-plus photos, and they're usually more than one photo uh, a year, and you just read a little paragraph about it, and you're gone. It's done. You, how much you would learn about the cutting edge of archaeology and how the Bible is coming to life there, uh, experienceisraelnow.com. We also have a YouTube channel, Secrets from the Ancient Past is what it's called right there, Secrets from the Ancient Past, or you can search for Pastor Andy Cook. And uh, we have about 80 of these videos that, because of the pandemic, I kind of went indoors and started uh, you know, doing that. Now, 
We also have trips to Israel. I, that's not my major thing. There are lots of companies that can take you to Israel. I would encourage you to start thinking about going. Um, many of you are older. Um, you know who you are. Um, it, it is so ironic that the older we get, sometimes now we have the money to take a trip like this, but my body doesn't want to do it anymore. Well, about 25% of the people I take to Israel are pretty young, students, young adults, young pastors, young seminary students. And the only way they're ever going to get there is if somebody makes a financial investment in them. I would like to see more of our pastors go into Israel as a gift of their seminary graduation rather than a retirement gift uh, so that they could, they could take in these lessons. And it's just it's an amazing experience. We take music on our, our trips. Uh, we have a hiking trip. We have a non-hiking trip. But you are going to do a lot of walking on the non-hiking trip. It's just better weather. Um, it's an expensive trip. Um, it's getting more expensive by the day these days. Um, but I'm telling you, that investment I've made in all... Well, I took my wife first, and then all three of her daughters, and they all got married. I took all of their husbands, and I've, we now have six grandchildren. I'm planning, if my body will hold out, taking all six of my grandchildren one day. It's an investment we personally believe in. Um, but here's the deal. If you have somebody in your life that you feel a little obligated to, you, know, you just heard the speech, and you go, yeah, but I really don't care for him all that much. <laughs> they act like, look, I'm a preacher. I'm going to tell the truth. If you've got somebody in your life that you don't care for all that much, I've got a deal for you. It's a special deal. We're not going to run it very long, but here it is. If you'll give me half the money, I'll leave him there. <laughs> now they're laughing. And as far as, uh, I do want to thank you in advance for the love offering you're taking up today. You've been very generous with your hospitality, and I appreciate it. Here's what I do. This is, this is what I do. This was a regional conference we just had this spring. Um, we're going to continue to have regional conferences in middle Georgia. Perhaps you'd like to come to that. But I go to churches all around the southeast. I uh, actually have been up in Maryland recently, been to New Jersey a couple of times, New Orleans. Uh, we go to schools. If you have a Christian school, that would be interested in me coming over. We'll, we'll try to work that out. Um, and, and also, this ministry began in prison. It began in prison. I was uh, doing a lot of prison ministry, and we just had this vision that I wanted to share with my guys more uh, about what I was learning. And then I, I realized, coming out of the prison experience as I preached on Sunday morning, wait a minute, almost everybody in my congregation is not going to get to go to Israel. And that's how the vision began. We were, we were in Zambia just before the pandemic started. Oh, how we loved that trip. It was phenomenal, teach, teaching a seminary there. And we also record videos online, um, I mean, in Israel for our YouTube channel and whatnot. And these are the two young men who have made um, a lot of this happen. William Hahn and his wife are missionaries in Ghana. He's a photojournalist. That's his job as a missionary. In fact, he's been on the Ukrainian-Polish border for the last uh, couple of weeks filming uh, for the International Mission Board trying to show people, you know, what the needs are and whatnot. And it's, it's just been an amazing work what he's done. Chris Dunn's up, a drone pilot in our community, and we now have, and it, I wish I had time to tell you my whole s story of how God called me into doing this. As Mark said a couple of times, nobody else is doing this. We now have more drone video of biblical sites than any other organization that we're aware of. And when I left our church six years ago, we didn't even know if we could survive uh, very long at all, even, even make it a year. Uh, so it's been six and a half years. It's been an amazing journey. Why don't we take a journey tonight? We'll leave where we are. I love Google Earth because you know this place is real. And, you know, but as you read the Bible, especially if you're like me, you've read it all your life, the Bible has kind of a far, far away feel to it. But the truth is, all of the places that are listed in the Bible can be found by archaeologists, or you can just go there yourself and take a bus over and see the Sea of Galilee or the Dead Sea or Jerusalem and whatnot. And so we'll go here again tonight. I'd like to share with you the purpose of why we're gathered here tonight. I don't take people to Israel for the T-shirt or the selfie. I'm very confident most of them are going to get a T-shirt. All of them are going to get a selfie these days. I say, I know that's going to happen. And I hope tonight 
you're entertained, uh, maybe you learn something. Um, but the reason I take people to Israel is that my life was changed there. Even as a saved follower of Jesus Christ, as a Bible reading, Bible preaching pastor, to be in the land completely changed me, um, especially after traveling several times. In fact, it was on my seventh trip when I, I called my wife to check in with her at the end of a day, and there's a seven-hour time difference. You have to remember that when you call your spouse from overseas. Make sure you do it at the proper end of that seven-hour day. Anyway, I was getting ready to go to bed. She was, uh, she was in the middle of her day, and we chatted for a minute, and I said, Honey, I, I need to tell you something. I, I get emotional even talking about it now. I said, um, I was on a tour with a guy named Ray Vanderlein. I don't know if you've ever seen any of his videos focus on the family and Zondervan has made him quite well known. But I was on a hiking tour, and we had just spent the most incredible day, and I said, Honey, I, don't, I need to tell you something. I said, um, I'm going to be different when I get back. And she says, what do you mean? And I said, I'm not sure yet. But I just know after today, I will never be the same. Uh, a year later, a lady in my church said, something's different about you. And I said, it's kind of like I got saved, isn't it? And she said, yeah, that's it. And I said, no, that's not it. <laughs> I promise you I was saved. It's just, I don't know. There was just, I just, it's like I got reintroduced to Jesus. I, I would encourage you, if this is something that you're thinking about doing, you know, uh, maybe, maybe find a group to go with. If you want to go with me, we do have a trip coming up in June. Uh, it's going to be incredible because there's not as many people there right now. But next year, they will break all the records for, for tourists. Um, I'm kind of looking forward to that kind of not. But um, anyway, we're going to Jericho. And at Jericho, we're going to look at uh, several... Um, and Jericho's going to be right, right here. This is the Jordan River, Sea of Galilee, Dead Sea. Um, Jericho had several communities around it, and I mean within walking distance, several faith communities, several different aspects of doing religion. And so while it is a crossroads area, it's also um, kind of a, a, a collision point of how to, how to deal with the Bible. Let's put it that way. Now, the message is called Selfishness Only Makes It Worse. I'm not sure that's the best title for it, but I do know this. If you are married, selfishness will make it worse in a hurry. If you are trying to run a profitable business and you decide to concentrate on profit, which could be interpreted as a form of selfishness, profits will go down. If you are in high school trying to be popular, it's highly likely you will not be popular if you're trying to be popular. Uh, if you are... Um, if you're in a church and you're determined to get your own way or there's, there's like a group here and a group there and a group there, uh, instead of somebody finally being happy, it turns out everybody's going to be unhappy. Selfishness always makes it worse. Now, why am I bringing this up? Because at Jericho, two of the disciples, two you would never expect to do such a foolish thing, to turn selfish only one week away from the crucifixion. When Jesus needed them to be on the same page, two of the disciples went for broke and said, we want to be first. Well, we're going to go to Jericho. So from the path of Jesus and the disciples going to the cross, maybe they took a boat ride down to the bottom of the Sea of Galilee, and maybe they followed this general path of the modern-day roads, we don't really know which path they took, but we know they came to Jericho. Now, there's, you could go over the modern-day Jordan, or you can go up to Jerusalem, or you can even go south, although that's a dead-end road. I will take you there and show you a group that lived there. But from Jericho, most of the travelers from the Galilee region, from Nazareth, from Capernaum, from those are familiar areas, would have spent the night in Jericho. These are dates uh, that were wrapped up to protect them from the insects. Jericho is a blue-collar community. It's a Palestinian community, if you, if you want to use that language today. And as you look around, you're going to see people who are living week to week, paycheck to paycheck. And in fact, the paycheck's not actually meeting all of their needs. There's a lot of poverty in Jericho. The people are friendly. Uh, it's, it's finally opened back up. There, was a, there were a few years around 2000 where Israel circled it off and said, you're an island unto yourself, and there were some terrorists you know, base there. But that's all been cleaned up. 
And now uh, this guy, for instance, he gave me, uh, what was it, an orange or something, you know, and he wouldn't let me pay him, and I was sitting there taking his picture, and he, he just wanted me to have the orange. That's, that's Jericho. The people of Jericho have been very friendly and used to people dropping by and spending the night for centuries. And this path of coming down the Jordan River Valley and then going up to Jerusalem was so well known that almost everybody in the Bible that you've ever heard of, you know, took it because they, got, they need to get up to Jerusalem. That's 18 miles. Now, maybe it's been a while since you hiked 18 miles up the hill, but this is what Mary and Joseph did on the way to Christmas. Pretty sure it was here. This is um, 800 feet below sea level right here. We got to get to 2,500 feet above sea level. And we know this is the road because there's water on this road. And 40 miles north of here, there's no water. And 140 miles south of here, there's only one source of water. That's at En Gedi. And, and that's not really, con it's not really on a road anyway but it is a wonderful road. Now, this is the road right here. It's a path. Uh, keep your eye on that path. Uh, it's pretty narrow. When I take my hiking groups on a little two-mile stretch of this road, um, they all walk single file. They just naturally walk single file. Uh, there's the aqueduct over here that Herod the Great of the uh, Christmas story built to get water to his swimming pool that you'll see in a moment, or at least you'll see a drawing of it. Um, and, and for 2,000 years, the people of Jericho have maintained that aqueduct to get water to their fields because you don't let water go to waste in what it amounts to a desert environment. This road is so famous and so well known to all these travelers that Jesus used it as the setting for one of his most famous parables. Do you know which one it was? Can you remember? That's exactly right. A man was coming down from Jer Jerusalem to Jericho when he was beset upon by robbers, and it was a good Samaritan who helped him. There were others, and there's the path on the other side over there. There were others who walked by him, who passed over him, who went to the other side. And I'm like, what other side? <laughs> and I think people laughed when Jesus said that. But, but you know, they basically, you know, but... This is very familiar. Now, what, is, what are your number one concerns? I'm going to talk to moms and dads. You're taking your family up to Jerusalem. What's your number one concern? If they're going to fall off. They're playing. They're going to fall off. Mary and Joseph, maybe she's got a donkey. Maybe she doesn't. Probably did. Um, I mean, the Christmas card said she did, so let's just go with that. So, Yeah, I'm nervous about that. Also, there's heat. Every time I've been on this road, it's 117 degrees. There's just something magic about that uh, number. And so you, you're worried about water. There is water on the road. There are three sources. But the prayer people would pray on this road is clearly identified in your Bible as a climbing song. I lift my eyes to the hills, these hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of the heavens and the earth. And what's the first promise? He will not let your foot slip. What's the next one? He is your shade at your right hand. He watches over you. You're coming and you're going both now and forevermore. It's a fabulous psalm, especially when you, when you picture taking your family on this road. Now, Jesus and the disciples came to Jericho. They met Zacchaeus. You remember him? He was a, he was a wee little man. It's in Luke. So, I'm just checking to see if you've read your Bible. So, anyway... <laughs> That's a Roman aqueduct that carried this, aqu this aqueduct. Uh, you can see the big Roman part, and this is, uh, I mean, that's amazing. That's, I know it, it looks like pretty rough, but it's been 2,000 years and been several earthquakes. But there's lots of water on this road, so about the time you run out, you can just refill. And that's one way we know 100% this is the road Ruth and Naomi took to Bethlehem from Moab. This is the road David took as he fled from Absalom. You've got to have water. Jesus and his disciples are coming up this road one last time. They have lunch, an early lunch with Zacchaeus. They need to get to Bethany before the sun sets because it's Shabbat. You've said Sabbath all these years. You go to Israel, you'll learn very quickly it's Shabbat. And the Friday night meal is the best meal of the year. But by the time the disciples and Jesus got to Bethany, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and were sitting down for the best meal of the week, the disciples are arguing about money. 
By the next Thursday night, nobody will even pretend they know about washing feet, much less go around the corner and get the basin and get some water in it and a towel and that kind of thing. They're kind of at each other's throats if you read it like this and you start looking at it. Something happened in Jericho the Friday before Good Friday that threw this little band of men who had been with Jesus three, three and a half years into chaos. Now, the good news is they're going to get a lesson from Jesus they'll never forget that brought them back together and they changed the world. And we're here tonight because they got their unity back. You can, you can get your marriage back. You can get your business on the right track. You can get promoted. You can become the most popular person in your school. Jesus will give you the model. If you will follow it, it has been successful for anybody who's followed it all this time. Well, let's go back to Jericho, and we're going to do kind of a lot of background for a few minutes. Uh, just pretend you're on a tour, and, uh, and, and, and we'll just go back to Jericho for a minute. There's Jericho. This is lower Jericho, and there's upper Jericho. This is big. This is blue collar. This is poor. This is a small country club. And people here are very, very wealthy. In fact, this is not their main home. This is their winter spa resort, their vacation home. Now, we're going to stop the video, pause it just for a minute. This is a tower. There used to be a swimming pool right here, and there's the main palace, and there used to be a bridge that went across connecting all of this. There were gardens. Remember, you're in a desert. This is very sandy soil. There were gardens. The, the pool, they said, was twice as large as an Olympic pool. This belonged to Herod the Great of the Christmas story. Now, he died just a short time after Jesus was born. Uh, we don't know how long, but he died. In fact, he died in Jericho. And so he died at this palace, and it was a miserable death. People couldn't stand to be in the house with him because he was rotting from the inside out. It was a sexually transmitted disease. He had had a wild lifestyle, and as cruel as he was, remember he killed the, the, the infants of Bethlehem, some of the remnants of his palace, you can still sort of catch the glimmer, a glimpse of how fabulous his house was. Um, now, this palace actually broken into three different parts, the tower and then another piece, and then this is the main banquet hall. All of that became one of Herod's palace, but there are more mansions in this neighborhood. Remember, these are second homes or third homes. In fact, for Herod, he had like 12 of these things all around tiny little Israel, um, a very, very small place. Uh, and so who else lived in this neighborhood? Who else lived in the neighborhood? Who else had enough money to have homes even close to this size and who could come down from Jericho in the cold winter and, and just kind of lay in the sunshine here in the summer, I'm sorry, in the winter, um, and get away from, from the snow in Jerusalem? The answer to the question is kind of surprising. It would, it would be the priest who were running the temple. Now, why is that surprising? Because while it's okay to pay your spiritual leaders a very good salary or, you know, it's, let's, let's give them honor, double honor, even Scripture says that's fine, but really second homes down here? with the richest man in the Middle East. It's like your pastor likes to play golf. Okay, that's great. Probably probably good, you know. But does he really need a private jet to fly down to mar largo to be a part of that country club? No. It was a rhetorical question, but you already knew the answer. These people were enjoying mar largo Now, why is that? Because the poor people of Jericho and Nazareth and Capernaum who literally were barely keeping their heads above water. The tax rate was something like 50% for some of them. And, and they're, you know, what if it doesn't rain and your crops don't grow or your goats start to die? Look, it, it was tough. It was hard to make a living. Well, they'd go to Jerusalem trying to love God with all their hearts, all their soul, all their mind, all their strength. And the first thing they had to do was exchange their Nazareth money for temple money. And, and the priest would take a cut of, you know, they had a kind of a, a what do you call that when the exchange rate gets a commission? They took a, a hefty commission, and then they took a, a cut out of the offering plate, you might say, and then they took a little more out of the offering plate. They didn't need any money. They, they were, the money the priest had up in Jerusalem was scandalous. John the Baptist 
was furious at them. And what's the first thing Jesus did when he got to, temp- when he got to the temple up here? Starts turning over the money changers' table. Well, here is some evidence for you about how much money the priest had because maybe you're going, I don't know if I've ever heard that or if I even believe that. Uh, don't believe me just because I'm saying it. Look at the evidence. This is a, is a mansion of a priest, not the high priest, but probably one of the chief priests that was found in the Jewish quarter of the old city. And even though it was destroyed in AD 70 and burned, archaeologists have been able to uncover it clean it up a little bit, and you can catch a glimpse of their wealth. These jugs, they say in today's money, $10,000 each filled with wine imported from Italy. So it wasn't good enough to go get a bottle of wine from the Jerusalem package store. They had to import it from Italy, $10,000 a jug. And it's just amazing at what's been found here. This was, again, not, not a, the high priest. This is just one of the priests. And a lot of these priests had so much money, they were able to build second homes down in Jericho and enjoy the the winter spa resort. If you wanted to get rich in Israel, you could either work with the Romans or you could work for God. Now, somehow that seems wrong to even put these two things in the same sentence. Um, John was not happy with this. He called them out about it. And so another part of the Jericho story is that just about two and a half, three miles from lower Jericho, you would have found John. Of course, John is dead by the time Jesus gets to have lunch with Zacchaeus. But John is baptizing here, very strategic location. This is where Joshua crossed over the Jordan, and it would have been at flood stage. All of this would have been covered with water. But there's the Jordan River down here. Uh, They've cleared out the landmines, and so now you can get baptized here. This is a recent thing, just a few years ago. You can get baptized here if you want to. This is the Jordanian side. You'll see the Jordanian flag right there, and the Israeli flag will show up in a minute on the other side. That's the border between Jordan and Israel, and it's a very comfortable border, uh, and you can get baptized right in here. The water is so polluted, it really is like being baptized with him in death and raised to walk in the newness of life, you hope. Don't brief, don't drink the water here, or you'll miss the next day of the tour. So um, <laughs> it's not good. Uh, you're at the tail end of everything that's been put in the Jordan River. Anyway, think about all of the symbolism that's here. This is where Joshua crossed over and the people began to take the promised land. This is where Elijah and Elisha crossed over. Elijah's taken up to heaven, and Elisha alone crosses back over This is where new things happen. This is where new ministries start. This is where Jesus will announce the beginning of his ministry, and he's baptized somewhere in the general location. But John sees some of the priests coming from Jerusalem. Did they come all the way from Jerusalem, or were they just bored over there at the country club? They had a horse track. They had all kinds of things over there at the country club that archaeologists have found, and he blisters them when they show up, says, you brood of vipers, who told you to flee from the coming wrath? Well, obviously, that was not a popular message with the most powerful people in in Israel. And so John is arrested, um, and, you know, one of Herod's sons had married his brother's wife, and it it was a mess, and John had called him out about it. John is arrested, and Josephus, the historian, says they took John to Macarus. Uh, Macarus is in modern-day state of Jordan, and it is an incredible fortress. It is, uh, it's up on a hill. You can see the ruins there on top of that. I didn't take this picture. These, I think, are, came from National Geographic, actually, and they're kind of fuzzy. We're going, we hope to go to Jordan in, in uh, April and get our own high-quality images here. If you don't mind praying for that trip, that's, that, that's kind of like um, seeing, you know, it's like we don't know if they're going to let us shoot drone video or not, and we don't know if we're going to get arrested or not. That's what I'm saying. I always kiss my wife one more time before I leave on these trips, and I would really appreciate the prayer cover. But Macarus was built up, and it would have been an incredible thing. And that's where John was executed, within inside of the Dead Sea. And we know that not from the Bible, but from out, sources outside the Bible. Now, as long as we're at the Dead Sea, we, let's just at least talk about it for a minute. Um, the Dead Sea is the largest, saltiest, body of water. It's not the largest, but it's the, this is, well, there's several things about it. It's the lowest point on earth. 
1,400 feet below sea level. It's eight times saltier than the world's oceans. Um, it's at some points, it's 25% salt content. And there are other minerals in there. Nothing can live here. That's why it's called the Dead Sea. It can look so pretty, but it's, it's really, once you lay in it and float in it and get that out of your system, um, very few of my travelers who return with me float in the Dead Sea a second time. It's like one time was enough. Um, and, but look, the Dead Sea is dying. It's receding. I don't know if you know about this ecological emergency, but because people are more important than something like the Dead Sea, they've been taking water out of the Jordan River for crops and for people to drink the water for decades now, since, oh, around 1950, let's say, um, and, and the Dead Sea is receding. How much receding? Well, pretty incredible. Uh, all of this used to be underwater. Uh, it, the Dead Sea is very deep. It's not like we're going to run out of, out of water. But watch this. Google Earth. All of that area right there used to be underwater. And this little area right here, it's a mile from here to here. Well, I'm going to highlight a section right here and then show you a picture that was taken about 100 years ago. The water came up to the base of the cliffs. Isn't that crazy? So that's an... That's, that's an ecological thing you can see. Now there's a road down there, and there's all kinds of sinkholes, um, and people like to walk around the sinkholes, but if you fall into one, you're going to need some help getting out of it. It's a little like quicksand, um, and the sun is so hot, you'd probably die of dehydration before you died of some horrible thing that I'm going to give somebody here a nightmare about it. <laughs> well, I want to ask you a question. Would you like to live here where this man is? How about vacation there? You want to vacation there? It's 110 degrees. There's no water you can drink. If you go swimming, thinking it'll cool you off, you'll find out the water is really hot and it's full of this mineral stuff. You know, they pull all kinds of minerals out of the Dead Sea, obviously salt, but they also pull potash out of the Dead Sea. So things they make with uh, the Dead Sea products, very expensive beauty products. You ever, have you seen Dead Sea products, ladies? Have you seen Dead Sea products? Some of you, some of you have. I used a lot of it. <laughs> Doesn't work. They also make kitty litter out of it. So, ladies, if you ever run short of your makeup, <laughs> yeah, it's the same stuff. Clean kitty litter. That's what we're looking for. Now, here is the deal. <laughs> there was a group of people who decided this is where they were going to live. Remember I told you that road from Jericho led south and it was dead end? Not very far, about five miles, uh, not, maybe not even five miles. Um, there's a dead end down here, and there's a community called the Qumran Community that most of you have heard of, even if you've not called it the Qumran Community before. But there were people living there, and not a few, a lot of people were living there. And some of them used to be priests up at the temple, and they got sick of the corruption, and they decided to move to Qumran on the shoreline of the Dead Sea at the base of the Judean wilderness. They would have lived more in the Judean wilderness if the road would have taken them further, but the road dead-ended right here. This is as far as they could get to living in the Judean wilderness. The Judean wilderness is that rocky, wild landscape between the Dead Sea and Jerusalem and Bethlehem. It's about 40, 45 miles north to south long, and it's about 15 miles from the Dead Sea up to Jerusalem. But the elevation drop is incredible. Now, the reason you've heard of this community is that they want, their main jobs seem to be writing down scrolls. They, they were a communal group. They, they shared living expenses, and they were concentrating on holiness, and they copied Scripture, especially the scroll of Isaiah. And when the Romans started putting down the Jewish revolt, say, in 66 up in Caesarea and 68, and they got closer and closer to this area, these people began hiding their scrolls in caves. Do you know what those scrolls were called? The Dead Sea Scrolls. The, Dead sea scrolls. the most famous find in archaeology, uh, 1947. The modern-day state of Israel was born one year later. Um, even last year, last summer, some more Dead Sea Scrolls were found. Um, very small fragments, just from two books of the Bible, but they were found, and they were a few miles south of here in a different... But there have been several caves. This is cave number four right here, and 4B is on the other side 
and then there's some other ones. And the scroll of Isaiah, the complete scroll of Isaiah was found. Now, let me tell you why that's important. When the King James Bible came out in 1611, King James of England authorized an English version of the Bible. And, and that was almost a declaration of war against Rome and the whole Catholic system, but King James was on an island, and he just decided to make his mark in history. Well, that was only 1611, what, 400 years ago, 410 years ago, 11 years ago. I'm not real good at math, but it was not long ago. In the scope of 2,000 years of history, not all that long ago. He asked the scholars who were going to do that to not translate from the Latin Vulgate, but to translate from the Greek and the Hebrew. So this would be an academic work of integrity. And they, they used the, the, the scroll of Isaiah that they had or the, the copy of Isaiah they had that they would have said is the oldest one we have to try to get back to 700 years before Jesus when Isaiah's words were written down. The oldest copy they had was about 900 A.D., 900 A.D. So in 1611, they were able to go back, oh, I should have never started this math, 700 years or so, um, and they got that. And, and a lot of scholars in the late 1800s, early 1900s were saying things that if we could find the original documents, we would discover all the errors that must have transpired in all the copying that went along all these years, and we sure would like to find those original documents. Well, they never found the original documents. I mean, it's a long time ago. But the scroll of Isaiah, not in this cave, but in another cave up in the hills, it was a complete scroll of Isaiah. It's called the Great Scroll of, scroll of Isaiah. It's on display in Jerusalem today, was 1,000 years older than the previous oldest copy. So everybody's pretty curious. How is this going to work out? After years of study, the errors that have been found, if you want to call them errors of punctuation because there was no punctuation, or maybe a spelling error, but the message is exactly the same. The copying was exactly the same. I say that because archaeologists and a lot of scholars have gone about a lot of work, in a sense, not really trying to prove the inaccuracy of the Bible, but it turns out just the opposite has happened. And I want you to know when you open your Bible in the morning and you read something out of it that it's a really good, accurate copy of what God intended for you to read. It's faithful. And these people did it. But the thing is, why did they do this? Why would they want to live in a place like this? This is their community, an aerial photograph. It's, it's so hot here. I mean, for years, I would walk away. We'd be driving away in that air-conditioned bus, and I, we would have visited the Qumran, and I would go, ah, oh, we forgot to take pictures again. I mean, it's seriously so hot that you, all you really want to do is leave. I'm not making that up. You know, and they lived here on purpose. As they worked, they wouldn't talk to each other lest they, they maybe sin or have to say the wrong word. Um, they... they it, it was such a crazy community. If you wanted to be a part of it, you had to try out for the community for one year. You had to live with them, obey their rules, not get kicked out. And at the end of one year, if you still wanted to be a part of the Qumran community, you had to give them all of your money. They had a lot of water here. Now, wait a minute. We live, they're next to the Dead Sea. There's no fresh water. They had a lot of fresh water here. Look at the aqueduct system. The storage areas are not just storage areas. That's a ritual washing pool. That's called a mikvah, and there's several mikvahot in Qumran. That's a storage area. This one was damaged by an earthquake. Um, so what happens is you go down the right side of a mikvah, and you sit in the water, and you ask God to forgive you of your sins. The water is washing you on the outside, getting rid of the, the dirt, and then you very carefully come up the other right side. You went down unclean. You come out clean. Um, the ritual washing pools are all over. That's just one illustration. I'm not real crazy about this one because it's, it's like closed off in two pools. But um, this one is in Jerusalem. There's several mikvahot in Jerusalem around the Temple Mount area. Remember the day of Pentecost? How many people accepted Jesus on that day when Peter preached? 3,000, and they were baptized. It sure helps that there are a lot of these ritual washing pools around with fresh water in them. My question for you would be, where in the world did the men of the Qumran community get their fresh water? And the answer is they went up in the hills and built a dam because every 
winter, while it will rain less than two inches a year here in this location and only in the winter, it will also rain a lot up in Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And as the water, some of it waters the crops and gardens and whatnot, but a lot of it's going to run down this, this eastern slope, 1,400 feet it's going to drop. And by the time it gets here, it's in a full-blown flash flood, raging rivers. And they built they built dams across areas like this. I don't know exactly where they built the dam. Maybe it was here. But I, look at this. This is a tunnel they dug through the rock for their aqueduct. And if you go on, on one of our hiking tours, we'll take a quick walk up here. It's not very far from the Qumran community. And we, we let some very flexible teenagers climb up there and show us that you can still crawl through there. They dug through this with, by, by hand. They didn't have modern-day tools. They wanted the water to be able to get down there, and they must have had a system of releasing a certain amount of water each day, and they had plastered the whole thing so they wouldn't lose a drop. So they could be ritually immersed every day in their efforts to be right with God. Like the man copying the scroll of Isaiah would get to the part, he would come up to the name of the Lord. When he gets up to the name of the Lord, he would put his quill down, and he would go outside to the ritual washing pool, and he'd get down in the pool, and he'd pray for God's forgiveness, and then he would come out, and he would go over to his, his desk, and he would write the name of the Lord, and he would go back, and he'd get in his ritual pool, and he'd ask God for forgiveness, and he'd come back. This was a very, very, do you know how many times the name of the Lord appears in the book of Isaiah? I can't count them. But they were very serious about holiness, righteousness. Why is that? Well, Isaiah said this, and this was, their, this was their favorite passage, and John liked it a lot too. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert. This is the way they read it. Uh, the rough ground shall become level. The rugged places a plain. The glory of the Lord will be revealed if enough of you will get serious enough about holiness and actually go down in there. That's the way they read it now. I'm not saying that's correct. But if enough of you will go down there and commit yourselves to 100% holiness, loving God with 100% of your heart, 100% of your mind, 100% of your strength, 100% of your soul, Messiah will come. And all this corruption up at the temple will stop. And it turns out, you could say it like this, it worked. Because just a few miles from where they were writing down those words of Isaiah, John's baptizing here, and Jesus comes to this area, and he says, John, it's, I want to be baptized. And of course, there was a little bit of a discussion about that, but he was baptized, and he came back up, and there's a dove that lands on him. And where did Jesus go next? Into the wilderness. He went right by the front door of the Qumran community, spent 40 days in the wilderness. Sad thing about the Qumran community is that they never, they never accepted Jesus as being anything. I mean, they just, they said, no, he's not it. The Qumran community, the, the Essenes, they're called, the Essenes, had in their minds that there were going to be two messiahs. One would be a military leader who would overthrow the Romans, and one would be a spiritual leader who would set things right at the temple. Jesus was obviously not interested in the military thing, and he wasn't doing everything in their minds just right, so he must not be the Messiah. And then they were ignoring Lazarus coming out of the tomb. They were ignoring lepers who were walking around clean. They were ignoring, you know, he's walking on the water, the stories about him stopping a storm. They're ignoring the prophecy about he would be born in Bethlehem and, and just on and on and on it would go. Because they had their minds made up what Messiah needed to look like. Between you and God, which one of you gets to be God today? You know the answer to this question? A lot of people are struggling with it. Thank you. But you see the Essenes, and I hate to be kind of rude about it maybe and say something about them. They had God in their box, and if it didn't fit in their box, you know, it must not be of God. Don't miss what God's doing. Don't ever put him in a box. God makes the boxes. He doesn't fit in one. Now, Jesus comes to this community 
comes somehow down here, and we, all we really know is he comes into Jericho. Now, he, he heals a blind man on the way in, and people are starting to sing and shout, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's going to become the king. He is the Christ. And the word Christ means king. He's going to be Christ. They're going to crown him up in Jerusalem. Let's go to Jerusalem. Let's go to Jerusalem. Passover is next week. It's the perfect time because Passover is kind of like Independence Day for Jewish people. They, set, they got set free from you know, the, Egypt, and, and they're retelling the story. And Jesus is going up to Jerusalem. This is it. This is it. And then he sees Zacchaeus, the tax collector who's working for the Romans, and he says, I want to eat with you. And everybody goes, oh. And then Zacchaeus gets saved and starts handing out tax rebates, and the party starts again. And, you know, it's, it's, and they're going out of town, and there are people in the midst of the group that Jesus has with them, the tight little group, which included the 12 disciples and some women. I don't know if you've ever read Luke chapter 8, first four verses. It lists the women who on a regular basis traveled with Jesus. And we know for sure that the mother of James and John was one of those who regularly traveled. Mary Magdalene was one of those. Um, so there, there's a small group, not just the 12 disciples who are around Jesus, who've been with him for the better part of three years, and, and Jesus is going to have to pull them aside, but there's some in that group who are starting to see how good this is going to work out. They're on the cutting edge. They are at the perfect position to ride this wave, and they're going to have the next homes in the winter resort country club of Jericho. So here's Jesus and the disciples walking along this path, and I just want to kind of remind you of how close they were to the country club. Because if you back this up, guess what you're going to see? Can you picture the grass, the swimming pool, the trees, the people lounging around? And there were those who thought, yeah, I think I'll take that house right there. That's going to be good. That one's going to be empty, so we'll, I think I like that one. We're going to cash in on this Jesus movement. Not Judas, not Thomas, James and John. Now, Jesus pulls them aside. The party is getting out of control. Maybe he sees it in their faces. Maybe he knows what's in their hearts. Maybe he sees them drooling over the swimming pool. I don't know. But he pulls them aside, and this is not the first time he's told them. He's been telling them this for months, maybe even as much as a year. This morning, if you were with us, we were up at Caesarea Philippi. After he says something about the gates of Hades. Three days later, they go up on a high mountain, which is Mount Hermon, almost certainly, and that's the transfiguration. And at the transfiguration, on his way down and with the group, that's the first time he says, we're going to Jerusalem, they're going to kill me. Don't worry, I'm coming back to life. So now it's one week from Good Friday, and Jesus says again, they're going to kill me. I'm going to be handed over to the enemies. Don't worry, I'm coming back to life. But you guys, get it together. Make sure you're with me. Can you imagine how much Jesus needed them to be of one heart and one mind right now? Well, that's verse 17, 18, and 19 of chapter 20. Watch what happens in the next verse. The mother of James and John, and by the way, Mark and uh, Luke just say James and John did this. The mother... Yes, she, she was a part of it, but James and John were not innocent. She says, my boys, they're so good, Jesus. You like them. You like them a lot. They're, you're always pulling them aside and taking them to special places. I remember that little girl that died up in Capernaum, and you took my boys with you up into that upper room. You love, you love John especially. He's your beloved disciple. Could one of them be your vice president and the other one your secretary of state? This is what I want you to pay attention to. When the 10 heard about it, <laughs> they listened to it. They were indignant. Simon's over there going, excuse me, there were three of us, always three of us. I was at the transfiguration. I saw that little girl raised to life. There are three of us that Jesus has been pulling aside. But guys, do you remember who he called the rock? And he said, you're the rock. I'm going to build my church on this rock. I'm the leader of this. And, and I'm telling you, by the time they get to Bethany, and Jesus probably walks up there all by himself, 
you know, just like, what did I do? Did I just waste the last three years of my life? Did I pick the wrong 12? They're arguing over how money could have been spent, and yet they all know that if Judas gets it in his bag, you know, it's no telling. There's just no accounting of it. And speaking of Judas, if James and John are going to make their move, maybe I should make mine. I'm telling you, this indignation is difficult. It's difficult. It's impossible. Marriages cannot survive selfishness. They just will not. Well, you might stay married legally, but you're not going to enjoy it. It's more like a prison cell. You, you, you want to be popular in high school, trying to be popular, trying to be popular? It ain't going to work. You want, you want to concentrate on profits? You'll start losing profits immediately. They get all the way up to Jerusalem, and they come down the mountain on Sunday morning with the Palm Sunday thing, and, and it's fabulous, and then Jesus starts turning over tables, and people thinking, oh, he's doing it. And yet, it just kind of peters out, and, and, and the crowds went away, and, and then they find themselves alone on, on, a, on a Thursday night, and they're having the Passover meal. Everybody's having the Passover meal all over Jerusalem, all over wherever their Jewish families are gathering, but especially in Jerusalem. And they're still at odds with each other because this thing with James and John, man, that, that was bad. And all of a sudden, around the corner comes Jesus with a towel around his waist and a basin full of water, and he starts washing feet. Simon objects, but gives in. Judas has a money bag that's full of betrayal coins, kind of bumping his leg as Jesus is washing his feet. And he washes them anyway, probably looking him in the eye. And he stands up, and he says, here's how you save your marriage. Here's how you save your business. Here's how to become loved by all the people in your high school. Here's how to save your church. Now that I've washed your feet, this was actually something I want you to do. I just gave you an example, Jesus said. Now, I've been married close to 43 years. Um, we have a good marriage. We have led marriage retreats, and we've read a lot of books on marriage, and, and, uh, and we've, we've had just a vibrant marriage. We love being with each other. We, uh, we have, you know, as I pastored the churches for those 27 years, we would pick out couples in our church and literally would go home at lunch and say, we want to be like Betsy and Bill Osteen. Did you notice they were still holding hands today? Or we want to be like this couple over here. We want to be like that couple. We'd spot them. What do we have to do to get to that point when we're celebrating 50, 54 years or 60 years of marriage if God allows us both to live that long? We're working at it, which means we have some full-blown arguments from time to time. It's called communication. Communication. When we were young, our arguments were silent. That's how we knew we were having a fight. Nobody was talking. Those days are gone. <laughs> We clearly communicate with one another, and it's actually better that way. But we had to learn how to do that. You have to grow up together. You have to mature together. But here's the real thing about making your marriage work. You wake up in the morning thinking about the other person. He wakes up thinking about her. She wakes up thinking about him. And they work throughout the day to think about each other. How can I make his day better? How can I make her day better? Including when God gives you children, if that's part of your life, and, and I don't know why God gave them so much energy at the end of the day when the mom and dad don't have any left, but they do. And so it's a chance to wash your feet just by washing the children in the bathtub. It's the chance to, to bless him and, and serve him by preparing the meal and, and doing something a little bit extra for him. Or, or she's usually the one with this chore, and I'm going to do it tonight. Or he's the one who always does this. But you know what? I'm going to do it because I think he would like to do this. And you you just serve one another, and you serve one another, and you serve one another. And you would think, some people would think, I don't want to be a slave to somebody. And listen, I promise you, you don't go to bed at night thinking, how did I get rooked into this relationship? I'm just a slave. No, 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 no. You go to bed at night going, how in the world? I am the luckiest person in the world. I'm married to a person who's been serving me all day long. Tomorrow, I'm going to win this contest. You want to be popular in your school? This is it. This is how you do it. Make everybody else popular. 
remember their names, find out what they're good at, brag on them, you know, you know, just, just keep talking them up, talking them up, talking them up. By the end of the year, guess who's going to be the most popular person in your school? It, it works in reverse. It's, I mean, maybe you call it reverse psychology. I call it servant leadership. I call it the Jesus model. Or in business, you ever eaten at a place called Chick-fil-A? It was their pleasure to serve you. They've made a model. The, the model of serving is, and they can charge more for their food than all the other fast food restaurants, and we pay it gladly. We love it. You know, it's servant leadership. Uh, and in a church, uh, so you're in, uh, those of you who are part of this church family, I, I just know that you're looking for a new pastor. And, uh, and so at some point, that's going to happen. I think what a wonderful season to be in, to have maybe even some conversations among one another. But here's the, here's the secret to a great church. You develop a group of people who walk in the door saying, how can I help? How can I serve in this church family? Not, what can you do for me and our family? If you have a church that's full of people who are looking for ways to serve, not only will you enjoy the experience, and I know you know this, I'm just, I'm just here to remind you at a key point in your, in your church life, not only will you enjoy the experience, it's been my observation that you cannot keep the people around a church like this from being attracted to you. They may want to be a part of it. Because it's a rare thing to find a group of people who have made it their life's goal to serve one another. I don't know that we're going to find it anywhere outside of the church. Well, the next day, um, I'm going to close with this. Uh, after the Passover meal, Jesus goes out to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's arrested. All the disciples run away. And Jesus is on the cross, you know, by 9 o'clock. And he's there. None of the disciples come out for a while. John finally comes out. He's the only one who comes out. One week earlier, he had asked to be either on the right or the left. And he and his brother and their mother had created division that he's just, he had to be humiliated about. But he's out there. Mary, the mother of Jesus, is there, and some of the other women are there. And of all the things Jesus will say on the cross, he only said seven that we know of. One of them was this, John, behold your mother. Mom, behold your son. Now, Mary had other biological children who would have been responsible for her care as she grew older. But Jesus is the oldest. Why? You got to kind of work through it, maybe. And I'm just going to offer my suggestion for why he did this. Gives her care to John, and Mary's going to be good with this. Listen, last week, John, you wanted to be important in my kingdom. You wanted to be a leader in my kingdom. So I'm going to give you a job today in the kingdom of God. It's got nothing to do with the country club down in Jericho. But here it is, John. If you want to be a leader in my kingdom, I'm, I'm going to introduce you to elder care. I want you to take care of my mom. You're like 17, 18. My mom's touching senior adult life now. This might have been her last walk to Jerusalem. It's, it's gotten tougher for her. But I want you to take care of her. John, you're going to have to walk slower because of my mom. John, you're going to have to learn what she's interested in. If you, The two of you are going to have conversations alongside the road because she's got different interests than you. And John, this is going to cost you some money. It's going to change your life, John. This is the way you're going to do that washing feet thing. I want you to take care of my mom. Because, John, if you can learn how, what a beautiful picture. If you can learn how to take care of one person well, really serve, then yes, you can be a leader in the kingdom of God. Mary died in Ephesus, where John was the pastor, many years later. Apparently, the two of them did exactly what Jesus had asked. And tonight, I'm just going to leave it there. You know, I don't know exactly what needed to happen tonight or why we came together. I hope you learned a little something. But more than that, I hope you're ready to either, for the first time, but probably for most of you, just have a time of renewal of focusing. Monday morning's coming up. Monday mornings are tough, but focusing 
of serving the people God has put in your life. Can you do that? God, thank you. Thank you for every commitment that's being made in the room, for every life situation that's come to mind. Um, Lord, <laughs> let's just say the obvious. I didn't bring that person to mind for the person who's thinking about who she needs to serve or who he needs to serve. I didn't bring that situation to mind that needs to be cleaned up. You did. That's your Holy Spirit at work. And so, God, we may never know what you're doing here in this place tonight, but here's what we, we do know. We want to love you with all of our hearts, all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. And we want you to receive the glory and your kingdom to grow. And however we need to model that washing feet example, um, Lord, we're, we're more than happy to do that. Thank you for loving us enough to sacrificially love us. Help us to do the same for the people you've put in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are so thankful that uh, you've come our way and you have uh, touched our lives in a lot of ways. Wednesday morning, uh, this community will have the opportunity to uh, honor a man who uh, sort of set the example of servant leadership. Uh, Bob, Bob Ford will be missed. And that service will be held on Wednesday morning at uh, First Baptist in Jacksonville. Just remember that family, if you would. If you're here tonight and um, there's some things that you need to settle in your own heart, I just hope that, that you'll find a way, find a person, find somebody who would be willing to, to listen and that you take what you've heard and what you've experienced and do something with it. Or you can just go on about your week. I hope that's not the case. As we close tonight, uh, Andy will be around for a while. You know there's some materials that will be available to you. There will be somebody at the doors to receive the law of offering if you wish to give it. We've been honored tonight by your presence and by the leadership of a man who is doing uh, a great work. And um, I hope he can come back to our community and uh, open some more doors of opportunity and learning. Let's pray for him. And as we close tonight, let me just pray a blessing over him. So would you bow with me before we go? Gracious Father, we, uh, we've seen some things, we've learned some things, not just for the sake of gaining facts, but of examining some matters in our own lives and dealing with maybe some tough questions. But there are people that place you place around us that are not there by accident. I don't believe in coincidence. And I believe that every one of us in this room can serve at least one person. And may that be our goal this week. May that be something that we choose to do with our time, our energy, our talent. Help us, Lord, to be like you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.